this passage is about uh, neoliberalism, the author's criticism of neoliberalism, especially in the context of India. Okay, let's quickly look at the passage, uh, note down the main points before we look at the questions and answers. After the disintegration of the Soviet Union, some proclaimed that there was no alternative to neoliberalism. Since then, the so-called triumphant march of neoliberalist cap neoliberal capitalism has seen many hurdles, such as the 2008 financial crisis. The worst victims of this march and its consequent crisis has been the disadvantaged sections. Neoliberalism has been on the rise since the fall of the Soviet Union, but the author says that the so-called triumphant march, that means the author doesn't believe that neoliberalism has really been effective, has seen many problems. There have been the, that there's been the financial crisis and other such crises, uh, since neoliberalism started uh, its ascent and the people who have been worst affected by it have been the disadvantaged sections, the poorer sections. This shows the presence of class conflict in society. Needless to say, the vulnerabilities of the disadvantages, disadvantaged are a creation of capitalism itself. He says, the fact that the disadvantaged section is suffering the most shows that the society has a division. There is a class conflict in society. Second point, he says that the vulnerability, the disadvantaged are vulnerable and weak because of the creation of capitalism itself. Capitalism itself is the cause of the weakness and vulnerabilities of the disadvantaged section. The French economist Thomas Piketty exposes the essence of neoliberalism. He says, this is what neoliberalism is all about which leads to unprecedented inequalities and disparities. So Thomas Piketty, the French economist, has exposed neoliberalism. He says, at its core, neoliberalism leads is such that it leads to unprecedented, never before seen inequalities and disparities, divisions, differences. In the Indian context, liberalization of the economy was initiated on the premise that the seemingly socialist and centrally planned economy had outlets, outlived its utility and that private ownership and market forces would efficiently replace public sector undertakings and provisions. So he said, in India, when we initiated, when we started uh, liberalization of the economy, it was on the premise that okay, we started it on the basis of the fact that the seemingly socialist, that means it wasn't exactly totally socialist, uh, and centrally planned economy had outlived its utility. It is not going to serve, benefit us anymore. Therefore, we need to let private forces, market forces, private ownership should replace this uh, 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 centrally planned economy should replace public sector undertakings and provisions. Such an opening up of the economy was also tried in other parts of the world with only one consequence. So India liberalized its economy. This kind of, this policy of uh, opening up the economy was also taken up in other parts of the world. And the result was the same. He said, what was that? unprecedented concentration of wealth in the hand of a few and a marked shift in the actual centers of power. What happened? Did it benefit the society as a whole? No. What happened is there was concentration of, uh, of wealth in the hands of a few of a nature that we'd never seen before. Unprecedented. There was no precedent or example of this kind of concentration of wealth. Also, the balance of power, the center of power shifted. All right, the people who are powerful were different now in this new liberalized uh, economies than the earlier power centers. Crony capitalism was soon making its fast inroads into the policy making coteries of India. What happened? Crony capitalism, he calls it, shows the author's contempt, right? It was making fast inroads, it was getting into the policy making coteries, the circles. Centers of power are called, a, cot a coterie is basically a group with an agenda, a, a politically strong group. So the policy making groups in India, those bodies can be called coteries. So it said that the policy making coteries of India had also got this idea of capitalism. 
this newfound confidence of the private sector bore fruits. But for whom? Whom did this benefit? He said, definitely not for the masses, as shown in a recent study that named India as the second most unequal society in the world. So in India, what happened? Policy makers, the centers of policy making in India were influenced by capitalism. And as a result, what happened? What happened, according to the author, is it did not benefit the masses because it led to inequalities and India is the second most unequal society in the world. According to the Credit Suisse Research Institute's Global Wealth Report, 1% of the Indian population owns 51.5% of the wealth in the country and the top 10% own about three-fourths of the wealth. So basically, wealth is concentrated in the hands of a small percentage of people. On the other hand, the bottom 60%, the majority of the population, owns 4.7% of the total wealth. So you see the inequality. Public education and now this is as far as uh, concentration of wealth and power are concerned. Next, look at the other consequence of liberalization. Public education and health are the most affected by capitalism. Educational spending by the center has been showing a downward trend. The center has been spending less on education. 6.15 in 2014-15 budget to 3.17 in 17-18 budget. So you see the, the cut in allocation of funds for education, 6.15 to 3.71. Instead of expanding higher education horizontally to more far-flung areas of the country and vertically to the disadvantaged sections of the society. So instead of education expanding horizontally and vertically, what has happened? Spending allocation of budget, funds in the budget for education has been cut down. The central government is allowing, okay, instead of expanding higher education both vertically and uh, horizontally, what is the central government doing? It's allowing the higher education financing agency to allow the private sector to dominate the education sector and make educa higher education a distant dream for the deprived classes. So what has happened now? Instead of the government expanding education horizontally and vertically, uh, education has also gone into private hands. And because of this, he says, higher education has become a distant dream for the deprived classes. Similarly, in the health sector, the government has show chosen private insurance companies and private healthcare lobbies as its partners, effectively taking away the attention from public infrastructure and its upgradation. So it has not upgraded uh, public in health infrastructure. It has taken the attention away from public health infrastructure and gone into private uh, partnerships with private agencies and healthcare uh, agencies. In a country like India, which is plagued with social problems such as widespread poverty, a deepening agricultural crisis, a very high unemployment rate and abysmal health indicators, very low or poor abys abysmal health indicators, giving away public sector assets to private players and shifting the discourse away from socialism would prove fatal to a vast majority of the population. So look at the author's harsh words, he says. In a country where there is so much poverty, there's so much social problems, you are giving away state assets to public private hands. And when you do that, the consequences are going to be very grave for whom a vast majority of the population, which is economically disadvantaged. India is doing badly on many parameters. We're not doing great on many uh, fronts, uh, on many factors. Nutrition, peace, human development, press freedom. While well, a section of the media is celebrating improvement in the ease of doing business index. He says we are lagging in so many areas and here the press is um, celebrating the ease of doing business index in India. In other words, and this is the author's uh, conclusion, ensuring that people live a decent life is subordinate or inferior to ensuring that business becomes easy for crony capitalists. Again, he has used the word crony capitalists. Which of the following statements, if true, would negate the assertion made in the passage? 
Now we have to figure out what assertion the author has made quite a few assertions. So again, think in terms of his main point. What were his main points? That neoliberalism results in um, ushers in a, an economic system where there's concentration of wealth in the hands of a few. Uh, and uh, there is public-private partnership. Most of the public assets are going to the private companies. And as a result, the worst affected are the deprived classes and the disadvantaged classes. The areas where India, uh, and in the context of India, he says, the areas that have been worst affected have been education and health. And then he gives you reasons. Education, instead of the government expanding education horizontally and vertically, it has got into partnerships with the private agencies. As a result, many have, do not have access to higher education. Private means lot more money. Second aspect about health also, he says the same thing. Correct? So this is his assertion. Now let's look at which sentence would negate that assertion. One of these points or one, the strongest of them. Privatization of education has resulted in masses having access to higher quality, uh, to quality higher education. Author has said because of privatization of education, for the masses, higher education has become a distant dream. And here, if this is true, that privatization of education has resulted in more people getting access to education, that would definitely go against his assertion. So A looks like a very good answer. But let's also look at B, C and D. The improvement in the ease of doing business has actually made business more difficult for honest businessmen. Do we, are we talking about honest businessmen? Is the author's assertion anything about businessmen? He just says ease of doing business has increased and the press is praising that instead of anything else. So it is not negating anything he has said. So B is out. Health and education for the masses have not made great strides under neoliberalism. This will not negate the assertion. This will strengthen the author's assertion. Right? Neoliberalism may result in unprecedented inequalities, which is what the author says, which strengthens what he is saying, but also provides massive employment opportunities to the masses. Now, if it did... Then if the author, has the author mentioned anywhere in the passage anything about employment opportunities to the masses, then if he said that employment opportunities for the masses have gone down, then this would negate the statement, if true. But the author hasn't mentioned anything about employment. He's only talked about education and health. Therefore, we cannot take D as negating a statement the author has made. If you say, okay, it says if true, it's... If this is true, it kind of shows a benefit of neoliberalism. True, but the passage is asking me to negate a sentence, an assertion, a claim made by the author. Author Has has the author made any claim about employment going up, going down? No, he has not mentioned employment. Therefore, D is irrelevant. But he has talked about education becoming, higher education becoming a distant dream for uh, the deprived sections of society. Therefore, if if you say privatization actually increases uh, employ, uh, educational opportunities for the deprived classes, it negates his assertion. Therefore, my correct answer is A.